it never occurred to me that I'll be a chief. Even though my mother was a royal, my uncle was a chief at that time. You see, in the Akan system, we did not operate the system of primogeniture. In other words, uh, the one who will be chief is known, like maybe the, you know, the British uh, crown, where the first son becomes the automatic uh, heir of the throne. Ours is selective as well as elective. So the elders have the chance of you know, selecting from among a whole gamut of royals to be on this tour. Some 40 years ago, on the 31st of August in 1971, the quiet and serene town of Asante Drabin, still reeling from the shock of the demise of Nanayao Sapon II, one of the greatest kings ever to ascend the Adakwa Yadomose Shidiya stool, exploded into ecstasy, excitement and jubilation, shaking the very foundation of Drabin. The kingmakers had found a successor to Nanayao Sapon II, the late occupant of the great Adakwa Yadomose Shidiya stool of the ancient town of Jabin. With face and upper body besmeared with white powder to signify his election, Odishie Yaobuachi, also known as Peter Amponsa, was carried shoulder high and paraded through the streets of Jabin as the community went into ecstasy over the choice of its first university educated ruler, youthful, handsome, and regal in bearing. The 26-year-old Peter Amponsa, a Kwame Nkrumah University of Science and Technology trained engineer, had taken the mantle of his late uncle, Nanayao Sapon II, the first literate Omahini of Jabin. The Omahini elect was carried to the Esumine Muhini's house, which houses the Apatim for his 40 days of confinement and schooling in traditional governance and orientation in kingly bearing. This is where a chief elect has the privilege of meeting all those who matter in traditional norms for his tutelage. Nano Tuo Srebuo had the rare advantage of the company and support of his biological mother and the incumbent Queen Mother of Jabin. The companionship of his father, Openyin Kwejue Champong, was a great boon. Openyin Kwejue Champong was a stool elder, admired for his sagacity, wit and unparalleled knowledge of Akan customary law, usages and folklore. According to Akan, and for that matter, Asante custom, the incumbent Ohima or Queen Mother of the traditional area nominates a chief when a vacancy occurs. Nana Kosya Chama II, 1969 to 1994, the incumbent Jabin Hima, incidentally the biological mother of Odishie Yaobuachi, selected the candidate. The kingmakers, without hesitation, unanimously approved the nomination. On the 13th day of September in 1971, Odishie Yaobuachi, after graduating from the Apatim School of Traditional Norms, Usages and Practices, met the Oman, took the oath of office and assumed the stool name Otto Srebo II after his great uncle Otto Srebo I, 1907 to 1933, described by Professor Edubwahin as one of the greatest kings to ascend the Jabin stool. The first hurdle in ascending a paramountcy in Asante Kingdom is the swearing of the oath of loyalty to Otunfo the Asantehine. On Monday, September 20th, a day before his birthday, Nano Tuos Rebwa was presented to Otunfo Pokuwari II. The over two hour plus ceremony marked the final inauguration of the era of Otuo Srebuo II. Odishe Yaobuachi was born in Jabeng on September 21, 1945, to Nana Kosya Domtie of the royal Ayoko clan of Jabeng. His father was Openyin Kwejue Champong of Ediana clan of Etia near Jabeng. At the age of five, Odishe Yaobuachi was enrolled at the Methodist school under the name Peter Amponsa. In 1958, young Peter Amponsa, then 13, sat and passed the common entrance examination to secondary school. 
he entered Opokuwari Secondary School in 1959. Odishie Yaobuachi did not abuse the opportunity and won the best student awards in his class on several occasions. He qualified for sixth form, but having spent all his life in Asante, Peter Amponsa opted for Achimota Secondary School. Peter enrolled in the Kwame Nkrumah University of Science and Technology in 1965. In 1969, Odisha Yaobuachi graduated with a BSc degree in engineering after four years of hard work and eventually stepped out of school with confidence into the world of work. The world of work had its own challenges, but young Peter Amponsa was equal to the task. Peter Amponsa's first job was with the Volta Aluminum Company, Valco, at Tema. But barely two months after, Peter left Valco with a fellow engineer, Stephen Akoku. The two took appointment with the electricity company of Ghana, ECG. Odisha Yaobuachi's schedule placed him under a Swedish engineer, Folk Jonsson, to kickstart Dr. Buzia's rural electrification program. In 1971, the ECG offered Stephen and Peter scholarships to pursue postgraduate studies in the United Kingdom. Stephen left in August and Peter was to follow in the first week of September. But by twist of fate on the 10th of August, a delegation from Jabin brought the sad news of the death of his uncle Nanayao Sapon II to him while discharging his duties in Brekum. The kingmakers first offered the stool to his elder sibling, Dasibro Tibuating, now Omahini of New Jabin, who declined the offer. The kingmakers turned to Odishie Yaobuachi with reluctance and trepidation, he accepted it. On August the 31st in 1971, he was proclaimed Jabin Hini. Jabin is not just one of the Asante towns. The Jabin stool was one of the nine founding members of the Asante Union in 1699, together with other Oyoko royal lines comprising the Overlord Otunfo, Kumase, Kokofu, Nsuta, Uncle, Bekwai, and the other non Oyoko clans of Mampong, Isumeja, Kumewu, and Denyase. Pre 20th century traditional leadership in Asante glorified war and heroism, and Jabin Stool's history is replete with legendary acts of bravado and heroism of its rulers. Indeed, it was the refusal of the chief of Jabin, Nana Adakwai Yadom, to surrender his wife to Ntim Jekere, which was the immediate cause of the Asante Densha War around the turn of the 17th century. And Jabin played the leading role in that war, and uh, we ended up being the very people who captured Ntim Jekere and brought uh, his head to Kumasi. So Jabin has been an integral part of the Asante Union since its foundation. And my ancestors who came after Nana Adakwa Yadom, Nana Osehwidye, uh, Nana Akresi, uh, Nana Kuyama Bwatin Penny, all fought with the Ashanti wars, wars of expansion, which culminated in Ashanti governing or controlling land area, which is uh, greater, uh, bigger than the current line south of Ghana. Today, a chief's achievement is measured in terms of development projects impacted on his people rather than the number of years of occupancy. The journey ahead of the young engineer turned chief was difficult and daunting, not just because of the great stool he occupied, but more so because of the pace those before him had set. Nanayao Sapon II, who he succeeded, had set a great standard. The first literate Omahene of Jabin. By 1947, he had succeeded in lobbying the Methodist mission to upgrade the Jabin Primary School to a senior school. In 1948, recognizing the importance of female education in national development, Nana Sapong established Jabin Girls School. He supported youthful members of the royal family to attend school and also encouraged the citizenry to have an education. He even granted a scholarship to a citizen to study at Infansipim. The great uncle, whose name Nana had adopted, has his own legacy. 
The era of Nanotuo Cerebo I, 1907 to 1933, led to the development and modernization of Drabin. His legacy includes an imposing palace, a magistrate courthouse, the prison house, the post office, and the planning of Drabin Township. His reign also saw the return home to Old Drabin of many of the Drabin exiles in Achim. Naturally, the people expected greater things from the young, university-educated king and the first university graduate to occupy the Adakwa Yadom and Osei Shidiye stool. Nanoto Srebo II accepted the challenge. On Holy Saturday in 1972, Nana launched a five-year development plan for Drabin. This was after consultation with the elders of the town and the Drabin Youth Associations of Kumasi and Accra. Proper planning of the Drabin Township, public places of convenience, improvement in the educational infrastructure and construction of extra classrooms, construction of street drains and tarring of the roads, access to potable water, electricity supply and reconstruction of feeder roads linking Drabin to its villages are some of his accomplishments. During the launch of the five-year development plan and the fundraising exercise, Nana said he was departing from the imposition of levies on the people. He would rather fund projects from his own resources and accept voluntary contributions. The result was overwhelming. 11,000 CDs was realized from the fundraising. The five-year development plan was successfully carried out. Several other development plans followed. By dint of hard work, coupled with sagacity, tenacity, and foresight, the achievements of Nanoto Sribo speak for themselves. Drabin now boasts of a circuit court, while Drabin Rural Bank has an international reputation. The health center now hosts medical students from the KNUST Medical School for Clinical Studies, a modern ICT center. Some five primary and junior high schools improved water supply with a 5,000 gallon reservoir serves the people of Drabin. And these are among the other developments. One cannot go to Drabin without noticing the famous Nane Chama market containing over 200 stalls and stores. The comfort of his people was of paramount interest to Nana. He therefore extended his developmental efforts to the area of housing. By 1973, the first batch of 20 houses built by the Department of Rural Housing were inaugurated in a part of Drabin called Estate. One bold decision taken by Nana on his ascension to the stool was to become a professional chief. He abandoned the idea of continuing to work with the ECG. He, as a farmer's son, put the experience gained in his teenage years to use. When I became a chief, the problem or the, the issue that faced me was either to continue in my job as an electrical engineer and be an absentee chief or come and settle here. I remember I was only 26 years old and I'd gone on uh, a premature retirement. But I thought that if I, you know, identified with the people by going along their public uh, avocations, by in farming, I'll be able to understand them better. I have some forum or platform for communicating with them. Because if they came out ah, and they were, uh, they were distraught that the rains have not been coming, if, if you are not a farmer, this will not cut ice with you. Yes, you know. But then when you start talking about the rains not having come and the, the corn having tasseled without the rains coming, you know, they see you as part and parcel of them. So I went into farming. I remember when we were young, my mother, who uh, was a queen mother at the time I was a tool, you know, was a first time farmer, big time farmer. And we had to live in his village three miles away and commute from there to school every morning. You know, so going back to farm was going back to my roots. And uh, I, I, I did enjoy it. He started with a 40 hectare farm producing maize and cassava with a labor force of 15 permanent farmhands, and it was a success. This was at a time when many a chief would rather exploit the labor of his people. 
1974, he started intercropping the maize with oil palm trees. By 1976, he had cultivated 200 hectares with 65 farmhands. Nana was not an absentee farmer, and as the adage goes, if the royal does not fight, the slave bolts. He was regular at the farm. The success of oil palm plantation depends on a good nursery as a regular source of seedlings. Joabing Oil Mills established its oil palm plantation together with a very good nursery to ensure regular supply of seedlings. The nursery supplied all the seedling needs of the plantation. The outgrowers also had their fair share of good seedlings. It came tops among 50 innovative and successful companies in Africa. In 1997, the Drabbing Oil Mills Limited was adjudged the best innovative enterprise, small-scale division by the United Nations Industrialized Development Organization, UNIDO. In 1981, he won the Best Large-Scale Oil Palm Farmer Award. By 1980, the production base of Nana's farm had hit 1,400 hectares of fruit-yielding oil palm trees, and this gave birth to the drabbing oil mills we know today. Today, the mill employs youth from the town and its environs. A number of the growers are finding ready market at the oil mill. In 2007, Drabbing Oil Mills Limited vertically integrated its operations with an addition of crude palm oil refinery capable of processing 50 tons of palm oil per 24 hour day for the production of highly refined bleached deodorized palm oil, commonly called cooking oil. Today, we find the refined edible oil branded Jomil cooking oil in the market. A section of the mill also processes shear butter with a capacity to process 50 tons of shear nuts a day with raw materials coming from all over Ghana. Palm oil uh, processing creates a lot of waste. The palm has uh, the palm shells, the spent branches, and you have to have a means of disposing of these. So I contacted my colleagues, we did uh, a study, and we realized that after doing an energy balance, we could burn these products in the boiler, generate steam, and for the steam to turn the turbine, and the turbine to give us electricity. So we now use our own raw, uh, waste products to burn in the boiler, and we get electricity. And we are able to supply free power to the hospital which are close by, and to the pumping station. So uh, it's all um, maybe uh, engineering, in the practical. The mill is the second Beja palm oil producer in the country after Lever Brothers.
Animal protein, no doubt, is one important thing which man needs to stay healthy. Unfortunately, Ghana currently relies heavily on imports to sustain her growing population. The nation's local production accounts for less than 30% of national requirements, with over 70% being imported from outside, mainly from the countries north of Ghana or as frozen beef from elsewhere. Anybody going into livestock production in Ghana is therefore welcomed with open arms. The success story of Nana Utsuo Strebo's oil palm plantation and mills did not stop Nana from venturing into the livestock industry. Nana therefore introduced cattle to Asante dropping, the Guinea and Sahel savanna zones.